Hi, my name is Lynn McTaggart. Welcome to my podcast, Living the New Science. In these podcasts, I'm covering some extraordinary discoveries by frontier scientists and why this changes everything we think about how our world works and also how we should live our lives. Today, I want to talk a bit about the pineal gland and whether we have a special psychic antenna. Psychics in many traditional cultures have maintained that human beings have a special connection with the Earth, and as the Earth and the planets wax and wane, so we do too. Is there any evidence for this? And if so, how can we maximize our ability to tap into the Earth's energies? If we are picking up electromagnetics, and even other photons from other sources, as I've talked about in earlier podcasts, is there a single part of the body which serves as our antenna? Any Oriental mystic will tell you the answer lies with a tiny gland buried deep in the brain, which functions as the body's conduit to psychic energy and the universal cosmos. The pineal gland has been called the oracle of light, or the third eye in animals, because it lies close to the skin in birds that can distinguish day or night without the benefit of sight. Scientists believe that in animals, this gland acts like a receiver to monitor electromagnetic fields and help align the body in space. Indeed, it was once postulated that in many animals, the gland contained magnetic material. Changing the direction of magnetic fields around the heads of birds, for instance, alters their ability to orient themselves. In several categories of animals, reptiles, amphibians, birds, and fish, the pineal sits atop their heads and has certain characteristics redolent of a third eye. The pineal gland of the western fence lizard is plainly seen from an opening in the skull and has an optical lens. Under high magnification, a cornea, retina, and lens are also visible. It reacts to short and long wavelengths of light. Nerves connect this lens to the rest of the pineal and the brain. In humans, the pineal gland is a cone-shaped pea that sits on the roof of the third ventricle of the brain, directly behind the root of the nose, floating in a small lake of cerebrospinal fluid. Because it lies in the center of the brain, neurosurgeons and radiologists have found it a useful landmark for brain surgery. But until relatively recently, it was the subject of much lore as the gateway into the soul or the higher realm, the memory valve, an energy vortex, the main tap for vital fluids, and even the source of mental illness. Rene Descartes is often quoted as claiming that the pineal gland is the seat of the soul. What he actually did postulate was that the gland is a unique meeting point between body and soul. After Descartes, however, the gland was consigned to the neurological dustbin, regarded by the scientific community as an evolutionary leftover, the appendix of the brain. Then in the 1950s, Aaron B. Lerner at Yale University isolated a particular hormone produced by the pineal and dubbed it melatonin. Julius Axelrod, an American pharmacologist, neuroscientist, and eventual Nobel Prize winner, went on to discover the importance of this gland as our body's biological clock. The pineal gland has been called a window of the brain because, as with all midline structures bordering the third and fourth ventricles of the brain, it doesn't have a blood-brain barrier. Instead, it relies on a constant supply of blood 
via a particularly rich vascular network, considering its minuscule size. The late Italian Brunetto Tarquini, head of internal medicine at the University of Florence, considered the pineal gland the most bathed with blood of any organ of the body besides the kidneys. Thus, it is being constantly nourished with oxygen and nutrients, particularly in very young children. Another interesting aspect of the pineal gland is that it sits uniquely alone in a place, the brain, whose other parts are always found in pairs. The pineal is the first gland formed in a fetus, distinguishable a scant three weeks after conception, suggesting that it possesses a central role in the body. Although its full function is still poorly understood, in some scientific quarters, it's thought that rather than being simply another endocrine gland, the pineal may be the ultimate master switch in the brain, even controlling the pituitary. And it might possibly be involved in navigation. One of the thorniest problems in all of biology is how exactly a bird finds its way home. Research into the navigational skills of different species suggests that navigational aids differ according to the species. Some animals navigate by radiation from the sun or by visible cues, such as stars and starlight. Others, like honeybees, get their bearings from the sun's position. When they find a food source, they return to the hive and engage in an intricate circular dance, which acts as a map to show the rest of the hive the location of the food source in relation to the sun. Nevertheless, most animals that migrate over great distances appear to find their way by detecting tiny signals from the earth itself. Birds, butterflies, whales, and even bacteria all respond to the geomagnetic field of the Earth. This begs the most interesting question of all. Do humans have this same capability? And if so, have the more civilized of us simply lost it? Native Aborigines were said to have a perfect compass sense. That is, they could navigate and return home over vast distances. European explorers also wrote home about the seemingly fantastic ability of native guides to negotiate through apparently featureless expanses of woods, jungles, oceans, and fields of ice. But are they using a sophisticated means of environmental cues or reading something deeper, an invisible energetic signal from the Earth? Although this issue hasn't invited massive study, there's some preliminary evidence that we do have an innate ability to navigate, much in the way that animals do. The most in-depth investigation into the subject was carried out by zoologist Dr. R. Robin Baker, a reader in physiology at the University of Manchester in the UK. Baker carried out a series of experiments testing his hypothesis that humans, like animals, have a sixth sense about direction. In his initial experiments, he simply blindfolded his student participants and drove them, following winding and circuitous roads away from the university and dropped them off at locations as far as 30 miles away. These students were able to give relatively accurate descriptions of the direction of the university while remaining blindfolded. Only when the blindfolds were removed did they lose a sense of the direction of home. Convinced that he was witnessing some weak form of what is called magnetoreception, Baker then recruited a large group of schoolchildren, divided them into two groups, and blindfolded them too. He then attached a bar magnet to the far heads of the children in one group. In the others, 
he attached a considerably weaker magnetized piece of metal, but which was similar in shape and size to the other magnets. After bussing the children to a spot some distance from home, he set them loose. As he suspected, the children with the magnetized metal were far better able to find their way home. And as with similar studies where magnets interfered with the ability of homing pigeons to return home, the bar magnets were scrambling the Earth's magnetic cues. Other studies by Baker show that humans automatically point north in the absence of other clues. Baker's studies have been strongly criticized for their design, their conclusions, and their failure to be adequately replicated. Nevertheless, although some studies have failed to obtain the same results, a number of them have supported Baker's findings. Indeed, Baker himself gathered together all the studies by other researchers attempting to replicate his work and pulled the results into a meta-analysis, which is a pooling of all studies together. As he concluded, these experiments have produced results with a conservative probability of occurring by chance that is less than one in a thousand with respect to non-visual orientation and less than five in a thousand with respect to magnetoreception. As evidence of the existence of a non-visual ability to orient and navigate based at least in part on magnetoreception, the results obtained by other workers now rival those obtained at Manchester. One such study was carried out by University of Kiel researcher Mary Campion, but her results showed that the sixth sense is not universal. Some individuals appeared to possess a magnetic sense, but it was highly variable, or at least not so developed in everyone. Indeed, it may even differ between the sexes. At a special conference addressing navigation in humans, as well as other animals, researcher R. Guy Murphy presented a paper describing her own fascinating experiments with children and teenagers. Her studies tested the homing instinct in children as young as four. She discovered that this sixth sense was weak in children aged between 4 and 11 and was only marginally developed in boys. However, in girls, this facility suddenly blossomed at age 9 and continued growing in acuity until reaching a peak at 18. Murphy concluded that humans, and especially girls, are able to tune into the Earth's magnetic field. Murphy's study throws up many tantalizing possibilities. Are there true biological differences in our ability to read the Earth's energies? Or could it be that women, who are encouraged to listen to their intuition more than boys are, have more practice in tuning into these infinitesimally tiny cues. But if humans are indeed magnetoreceptive, what's the exact mechanism that enables us to tune in? Some researchers have suggested that certain cells in our body act like an internal compass, remaining tuned to a particular direction, just as a needle does on a compass. This also helps us to keep alert to any changes in the magnetic field. Some animals have been shown to possess magnetite, a magnetic mineral in their brain that's rather akin to lodestone, a naturally occurring magnet. Magnetite is found in many species of insects, birds, fish, and mammals, particularly among migratory animals. New evidence shows there are magnetic particles in the hippocampus of the human brain and also in the sinus cavity. Any rapid changes in magnetic field would create electrical currents that in turn would cause electrical currents within the tissues of the body. 
These would be picked up by magnetite in the body and ultimately resonate throughout the nervous system. Much of the recent research suggests that in addition to an actual magnet in the brain, the human pineal gland is also magnetoreceptive and able to feel any changes in the Earth's magnetic field. In fact, the brain hormone melatonin is produced at night according to geomagnetic fluctuations. This could mean that this highly misunderstood and very likely underutilized gland could assist in establishing direction. It appears that the frequencies of our body work in tandem with the body's reaction to light and possibly to geomagnetic fields. This could mean that the quantum frequencies of our bodies, such as biophoton emissions that we've talked about in earlier podcasts, could be carrying on a constant dialogue with the electromagnetic waves of the Earth. Rather than using one centralized processor, we may be hearing the music of the heavens through every pore of our bodies. The task before us now is relearning how to listen. So I'd like you to do some exercises just for fun to see whether or not you have a magnetic sense and you have a directional sense through it. So this is to develop your navigational sense. The first exercise is finding your way home. So you'll need at least two people, one blindfold and one small compass. Blindfold one of the two partners who's going to be the navigator. Have the other partner keep the compass in his pocket. Drive to a place that neither party knows. Get out of the car and have the navigator attempt to locate the direction home and then have him find the direction of north. Take the blindfold off and repeat the experiment. Have the partner keep track of the navigator's success. The navigator should now examine the two results and compare his success rate. He should also write down any feelings he had during successful direction finding, either with or without the blindfold. Have the partners exchange places, drive to a new unknown spot, and repeat the experiment. The second experiment is finding home from your garden or backyard or any open space. Once again, you'll need at least two people and one blindfold. Put a blindfold on one partner who is the navigator. Rotate the navigator a number of times as though playing the child's game of blind man's bluff. Ask the navigator to find home or find a particular direction without using any sensory cues. Again, note the navigator's success and compare it with his result without the blindfold on. And the third exercise is finding your way without directions. This is for you on your own. When you're not rushed for time, Try to drive or walk home a new way without a map or directions. Needless to say, make sure you go somewhere safe and well-populated. Follow your gut hunches about how to get home. Listen to your intuition and follow it. Don't become flustered if you get lost. If you truly cannot find your way, ask for directions but note where you are and see how well you did in finding your way thus far. Write down any feelings you had at the time that you made a correct choice. Continue practicing these exercises. Keep notes in your journal of the kinds of feelings you experienced, including physical or psychic cues, when you intuited the right direction. This is Lynn McTaggart, helping you to live the new science. Keep listening and I'll continue to give you information and vital tips each time about how to incorporate this new information into your life. 
And I'd also like to remind those people in Europe about our Get Well show, which is being held at Olympia, London on February 21st to 23rd. It's the first show of its kind to bring together all the best therapists and therapies that are being offered now in the alternative field with proof of efficacy. I've carefully curated some of the 41 speakers we're going to have there and all of the 100 plus stands with amazing vital information and products for people who have health conditions of any sort. So make sure to come see our show February 21st to 23rd at Olympia, London. And if you need more information and want to get tickets ahead of time, uh, go to our website, getwell.solutions. <music>